Well, <clears throat> what a blessing to be in a place where the Lord Jesus Christ is given the preeminence and that we have confidence in his word and, and we believe it. And we, we believe it's the final say on the matter. And uh, I can remember being at places, and maybe you have too in your past, where you'd get together for a Sunday school class and there'd be a group and everybody would say, well, what does this mean to you? And the next person would say, well, this is what it means to me. And then the third person would say something different and says, well, this is what it means to me. Well, <clears throat> what's important is what it means to God and what God has said in his word. And you know, nowhere in the Bible does it tell us to interpret his word. It tells us to believe his word. It, in fact, the Bible says it, it interprets itself. If we just study the words and see how God uses the words throughout the Bible, we'll get an understanding of what God means when he says what he does. And boy, it's a blessing uh, to be in a place where Jesus Christ gets the preeminence and the Bible is the final authority. So I'm glad we can meet together with that understanding this morning and just open up our Bibles and study it and be blessed by it. I mean, that's where, that's where you get the faith. That's where you get your faith. You don't get faith by people espousing their competing viewpoints and their competing opinions that oppose one another. You get confidence and, you, and your faith is increased when you just put your faith and your confidence and the reliability of what God said and you just simply believe what God says. That, that's what builds your faith up. That, that's what can help you grow in the Lord and, and praise God for a place like this where that's what's done because they're, they're not that many around anymore. So I'm glad we can meet together this morning and, and do just that. And so this morning we're going to look and see what the Bible has to say about Sabbath days. So before we do that, let's, let's pray. Lord, we sure are thankful for such a place as this, and we're thankful that you've preserved your word, and we're thankful that wherever two or more are gathered together in your name, you're there in the midst of them. So Lord, we, we come to you as needy people, and Lord, you've, you've never failed to meet our needs, and so we thank you for that. Lord, we want to have our own hearts inclined toward you. Uh, Lord, we want to love you more. We want to serve you better. Uh, Lord, we do truly want to be thankful for, for all that you do for us. You do so much for us, we can't even begin to count the blessings that you load us up with every day. But we do want to acknowledge those, and we want to have thankful hearts. And so we thank you, Lord, and just bless our time together this morning, and we'll thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. If you will, open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter number 1. We'll just start there. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 1. And uh, in Genesis chapter 1, we see God creating things. And as he goes through, he says he sees what he's created, and he says it was good. And then God concludes, and he considers everything he's made in verse number 31 of Genesis chapter 1. The Bible says, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day, continuing in Genesis 2, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended from his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. And get Jeremiah 32 and Psalm 121, if you will. Jeremiah 32, Psalm 121. Now, the Bible says God rested from the work which he created and made. And I would, I would submit to you that God didn't have to take a rest on the seventh day because he was worn out. He wasn't breathing hard, and he wasn't worn out because of all the work he'd done during those six days. But he did say that he was going to take a rest from all the work that he'd done. Jeremiah 32 Verse number 26, then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah saying, behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Of course, that's a rhetorical question. We know the answer. There's nothing that's too hard for God. If God had made the universe 10 times its actual size, 
it wouldn't have worn him out. If he'd made it 100 times, 1,000 times, the size it is, created a, multitude, a magnitude of a number of things in addition to what he made, it wouldn't have tired him. It wouldn't have worn him down. In Psalm 121, the Bible says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. So God doesn't get worn out. God doesn't have to take a nap. God doesn't have to you know, go you know, get eight hours of sleep every night. Nothing wears God out. So the fact that he created these things and he took a rest, it wasn't for God's sake. It was for our sake. And we'll see that as we get a little bit further into it. Um, turn, if you will, please, to Exodus chapter 31. Exodus 31. <clears throat> Verse number 12. <coughs> Excuse me. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Ye shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death, for whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh it is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord, Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a per perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Now, the Bible says the Sabbath is the seventh day. Sunday is not the Sabbath. Um, it was part of the covenant between God and the nation of Israel. Uh, there are Jew, there are non-Jews who try and appropriate the, that covenant, that relationship, and those blessings that were a part of that covenant between the Jew and God. But they are usurpers. They are robbing, if you will, or t attempting to rob part of that relationship that God had with that that nation, His special people. Now, two places in Revelation, the Bible tells us about people who claim to be Jews and are not. Revelation chapter 2, when, when the Lord speaks to the church at Smyrna, he says, I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. In Revelation chapter 3, he says the same thing to the, to the church at Philadelphia. Revelation 3, verse number 9, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. And so there are ways that, that groups or people try and misappropriate the relationship that God had with the nation of Israel. And among those, we would think of the, the Seventh-day Adventists. They, you know, they're stealing the seventh day. They're stealing the Sabbath. From, uh, from the nation of Israel. Um, we, we deal with, we've dealt in the past, and fortunately the black Hebrew Israelites down at Church Street have moved on somewhere else, so that they're, not, uh, they're not down there with foul mouths, cussing and cursing, and while we're trying to preach the gospel anymore, and praise the Lord for that. Um, uh, Mormons, they, you know, they, they claim that Jews came over and established North America, and they, they claim part of the Aaronic priesthood. They try and usurp things from, uh, from the Jews and Catholics with their priests and their priestly garments offering up sacrifices. They're basically, you know, they're claiming uh, by their actions to be Jews. You have British Israelism, which, you know, the nation of Britain was supposed to take the place of the church, which in a broader sense, replacement theology is the same way. So that covenant, that sign of the Sabbath was between God and the nation of Israel. It didn't include anyone else. 
So I think we understand that, and that's pretty clear. But what we did read that was interesting um, in that last verse that we read in Exodus that w was that God was refreshed on that seventh day. Now, we're not, I we won't get into it, but between, in any detail at least, but between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, we know that there was a judgment that was poured out. And uh, 2 Peter 3 speaks of a world that existed before our world existed. And in Ezekiel 33, the Lord says, As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. And so the inhabitants of the world before our world sinned against God, and it reached the point where God destroyed that world. And that's why you, we see in Genesis 1-2 that the darkness was upon the, the face of the deep, and, and that is a picture of the judgment. We see the same thing that's going to happen to uh, part of Israel in Jeremiah when Jeremiah uses the same language to talk about judgment that's going to come to the nation of Israel. So that judgment came upon the inhabitants of this world before we got here. And so when the Bible says that God was refreshed, my belief and my understanding is that after God had to do something that he didn't like to do, he took no pleasure in the death of the wicked, after he poured out all that judgment on the prior world and the inhabitants of that world, then he started to recreate this world. And at the end of those six days, he looked and he saw that everything he had made was very good. And by the fact of that recreation, it was refreshing to him to do that, to, to put man in the Garden of Eden and have a perfect relationship with that man. Of course, that, that was refreshing to God. That pleased God. And so I think that's why that language is there. <clears throat> okay. So turn to Mark chapter 2, if you will. Seventh day is a day of rest. It's the Sabbath day of rest. And it was not instituted because God was tired, but it was instituted for man's sake. Mark chapter 2, verse number 24. And the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? And he said unto them, Have you never read what David did when he had need and was in hunger? He and they that were with him, how he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar the high priest and did eat show bread? which is not lawful to eat, but for the priests, and gave also to them which were with him. And he saith unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. So we see this, God instituted the Sabbath and put it into effect, not because God needed rest, but because man needed this sign and he needed to be shown what eventually what this Sabbath was going to conclude with. And we're going to continue on and, and see that. Of course, most of us are, are, are familiar with Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace ye he saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now think about it for a minute. If God had made salvation by works instead of grace then everything would be flipped 180 degrees. And I think that would have affected how God dealt with the day of the week, or the days of the week. Now, which day was set aside, set aside as sanctified and holy in the Lord's day out of the seven days? It was the day that you didn't do any work. That was the sanctified day. That was the holy day. That was the Lord's day. No work, salvation's by grace. But now, if salvation had been by works, then the days that would have been sanctified, the days that would have been the Lord's day, the days that would have been holy days, were the days when you did the works. If salvation was by works, it wouldn't, the, 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 the sanctified day, the set-apart day, wouldn't be the day you didn't do any works. It would be the days that you did the works. And so I see you, we begin to see a picture right off the bat that God used the Sabbath to try and convince and convey to people that salvation was going to be by grace and not by works. So, okay. Now, turn, if you will, to Le Leviticus chapter number 23. So, so far we've seen that a Sabbath is the seventh day. Six days shall a man work 
seventh day, there's, you know, there's no work done at all. Every week, you had a Sabbath. But there are Sabbath days in addition to that weekly Sabbath. And that's what we see when we turn to Leviticus number 23. We see annual Sabbaths that God has established. Okay, so I, I don't, we're not going to read through the whole chapter, but let's just look at different verses here. In verse number three, God mentions the six days work shall be done. He talks about the regular weekly Sabbath in verse number three of chapter number 23. But in addition to those weekly Sabbaths, now we're going to see some individual days within the year, one, certain days within the year that are not set on a day of the week, but rather a specific day of the month. So they wouldn't necessarily fall on a seventh day. They possibly could, depending how the calendar goes, you could have one of these annual Sabbaths fall on a Saturday, but not necessarily because we know how the days of the week and the days of the months go. They don't always coincide. Each month, you don't, you don't see the same day you know, of the week on the same date in every month. They change. So <clears throat> in verse number 16, uh, verse number 6, we see on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread, and the first day, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. So there's no work to be done on this one day of the year, the 15th year, uh, the 15th day uh, of that month. Now, prior to that, the 14th day of the first month is the Lord's Passover. So we've got the first month of the year, the 14th day, and that's the Lord's Passover. We immediately follow that with the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and that day that follows the Lord's Passover, that is an annual Sabbath. <clears throat> okay. Verse number eight, we have an additional Sabbath tied into that. And that, and you shall proclaim on the self day, same day, it should be a holy convocation to you. You shall do no servile work therein. And that, that comes seven days after the beginning of uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So there's a second annual Sabbath day. In verse number 24, we see another one set, the first day of the seventh month in verse number 24. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall you have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. So there is yet another Sabbath day, an annual Sabbath day. First, drop down to verse number 27. Verse number 27. And you see, also on the 10th day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be in holy convocation unto you, and you shall afflict your souls, offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. You shall do no work in that same day. There's another Sabbath. Verse number 34, the 15th day of the seventh month, we find the same thing. And then on verse number verse 20, uh, 36, the 22nd day of the seventh month, you find the same thing. So all we see throughout, verse, uh, throughout Leviticus chapter number 23, that in addition to the regular weekly Sabbaths, God has established annual Sabbaths that the nation was to observe and they were to do no work therein. Now look at verse number 38. God explains that these Sabbaths that he's talking about are in addition to the regular Sabbath. Beside the Sabbaths of the Lord and beside your gifts and beside all your vows and beside all your free offerings, free will offerings which you give unto the Lord. In other words, on a regular basis, you make your vows. On a regular basis, you give your free will offerings to the Lord. And when we do these things in these specific days and these specific months of the year, these things that you're giving, in addition, including these Sabbaths, these are in addition to the normal, regular, weekly Sabbath which you observe. So these are, these are additional things that we do here. So as we talk about that and as we understand that we have annual Sabbaths in addition to a weekly Sabbath, it's kind of an interesting time to, to, to bring up and discuss and think about what the world calls Good Friday. <clears throat> Supposedly, you know, as far as the world considers it, 
they say Jesus was crucified on a Friday. And they do that because the Bible says that the Jews wanted to take the bodies down from the crosses in preparation of the Sabbath day. And of course, if you don't study your Bible carefully and the only Sabbaths you know about are the Sabbaths that occur on what we call Saturday, then you think, well, they were preparing for the Sabbath the next day. It had to be Friday when he died. But they're ignorant of the fact that Leviticus 23 explains to us that we've got more than just a weekly Sabbath. So, turn to uh, <clears throat> John chapter 19, if you will. John chapter 19. <clears throat> Now, I'm going to read this to you. I'm going to leave something out and see, you know, see where it is. John 19, verse number 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was the, pre pre uh, the preparation that the body should not remain on, upon the cross on the Sabbath day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So we've left out something there, haven't we? The Bible tells us this isn't a normal Sabbath day we're talking about here. This is a high Sabbath day. <clears throat> okay, so let's, let's set this up. Back in Genesis chapter 1, God tells us how he established a day what he considers to be a day. In Genesis chapter 1, verse number 5, the Bible says, And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. So God begins his day in the evening. He doesn't begin it. He doesn't begin at 12 midnight to start a new day. He starts around 6 p.m. the previous day. So if to just to just to, you know, just to give you an idea, you know, our current calendars don't work the way God set things up. So just for instance, we meet three days a week, or three times a week. And we meet on Sunday morning, we meet Sunday evening, and we meet Thursday evening. But if we were to, if we were to use God's way of stating what days are which, then our meeting this, this morning would be on Sunday. Because here it is, it's 10 a.m. on Sunday morning, this is Sunday. But when we meet tonight at 6 p.m., by God's reckoning and God's accounting, it's not a, we don't have a Sunday night service. We have a Monday night service. And when we meet together on Thursday at 7 p.m., by God's reckoning, that's a Friday night service if we were to count days the same way God did. So let's consider Jesus' crucifixion. In Matthew 20 to 8, the Bible says, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And what we know is the tomb was empty. So Jesus had already risen. It's before dawn on Sunday morning. So roughly, maybe let's say it's 6 a.m., the women go to the, to the sepulcher and the grave is empty. Jesus had already risen. So we know he rose on the first day of the week. So let's count backwards. He, thir, the first day of the week began at 6.01 p.m. on what we call Saturday night. So Saturday night backwards to Friday night, one day. Friday night back to Thursday night, two days. Thursday night back to Wednesday night, three days. So that when we count backwards, we go back three days and we go back to Wednesday night when Jesus is placed into the tomb. Now that we find out when we look in Matthew chapter number 12, verse number 38, the Bible says, then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in a whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So the only way to get three days and three nights in the heart of the earth is for Jesus to die, on a, to, be, to die and be placed in that tomb on Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, 
after sometime after 6 p.m., probably very close to 6 p.m., Jesus walked out of that grave. And that's why the tomb was empty when the women came that morning. So <clears throat> when the Jews said they wanted to take down the bodies from the crosses for preparation of the Sabbath, it wasn't for the regular weekly Sabbath. Jesus, he is the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And he was crucified on Passover day. The next day, that Thursday, began the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Bible says that is a Sabbath. So the reason they wanted to take the bodies down from the cross and deal with those bodies before the Sabbath was that Sabbath was going to begin at what we would call Wednesday at 6.01 p.m. So they did that in preparation for the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which be, would be a Sabbath on Saturday. Now, that doesn't mean... That doesn't mean that when the women went to the tomb and what the Bible calls the end of the Sabbath, that doesn't mean because we had a Sabbath on Thursday that we don't have the regular Sabbath of the week. We do. And that's why the Bible says they went there at the end, in the end of the Sabbath uh, to, to anoint the body. But it's interesting, it's interesting that that, that language is used. Um, well, I don't want to jump ahead there. Hold on for me just a minute. So <clears throat> we see that the Bible is correct. There's no contradiction. You know, when, the, when, when, when Jesus said he was going to be in the tomb three days and three nights, well, you can't get three days and three nights when you say Jesus was crucified on Good Friday and then, and then rose before Sunday morning. You just can't do it. And there are people who say that's a contradiction. But when you look at the Bible and you see what the Bible has to say about the matter, you find out that there's no contradiction at all. You, what you find out is there are a lot of people who really don't study it and understand what it says, and they just go along with the, with the current popular view. And so now, of course, everybody calls Good Friday the day that Jesus was crucified, and of course that, doesn't have, that has no biblical basis at all. So we've kind of, we've kind of covered that, and uh, now we understand that that's wrong. Now, there are some who say and teach that it's wrong not to observe the Sabbath days and the feast days. And maybe you've run into some of these Messianic Christians and they, get, they want to get tied up and, and deal with all the feast days that the Bible says about Leviticus you know, 23 and that we should observe those things. But, you know, stop and think about it. I've attended many weddings here and I imagine you have too. And I have yet to see a bride who looks down at the groom's shadow and focuses on that shadow instead of looking directly in her groom's face. Have you? You seen anybody? You seen any bride look down at the shadow? When you, married, when you married Blake, were you looking down at Blake's shadow? You were looking right in his face. That's the way it works. Colossians chapter 2. The Bible says in verse number 16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or the new moon or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of the things to come, but the body is Christ. Now the Old Testament Jews, all they had was a shadow. And God, tells, God told them, focus on the shadow. But we, we have a personal relationship with the one who casts the shadow. We don't have to focus on that shadow anymore. There's nowhere in the New Testament that the Bible instructs us that we're supposed to keep these holy days, the Sabbath day and the feast day, because of that very fact, because we have that relationship with the one who casts that shadow. So, <clears throat> now, one last thing about Sabbaths, and if you will turn to Leviticus chapter 25. Leviticus 25, And the Lord spake unto Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When you come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. <coughs> six day, excuse me again. Six days thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year 
shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. That which groweth of its own accord of, of thy harvest thou shalt not reap, neither gather the grapes of thy vineyard uh, the, of thy vine undressed, for it is a year of rest unto the land. And the Sabbath of the land shall be meet for you, for thee and for thy servant, for thy maid and for thy hired servant, by that stranger that sojourneth with thee, and for thy cattle and for the beasts that are in thy field shall all the increase thereof be of meat. You know, Brother James just <clears throat> reminded us the other night that the nation of Israel was taken into captivity and brought to Babylon because they didn't observe this covenant between God and the nation of Israel. And so they spent 70 years in captivity. Every, what there was was a cycle. You had a cycle of seven years. So the first six years, you operated normally. The seventh year, you gave the land rest. And that was a continual covenant between the Lord and the nation of Israel. But they did not keep that covenant. And so God took them into captivity. He took them into captivity for 70 years because for 490 years, they didn't keep this. And so the land was owed 70 years of rest. And in 2 Chronicles 36, the Bible explains that when they were taken into captivity, the, the land got the rest that it was supposed to have. 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse number 20. And then that it escaped from the sword, carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she did, lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. So we've got that 70-year period to make up for the fact that the Jews didn't keep this covenant. So, final point. <clears throat> you have seven cycles of seven years, 49 years. Then in the end, on the 50th year, at the end of that cycle, you have a special year. You know, the Bible says that, the, in, the, in the Bible, seven is the number of completion. So at the end of that seven cycles of seven years, 49 years, going into the 50th year, you have what the Bible tells us in, in here in Leviticus chapter 25, you have the year of Jubilee. And what happens in the year of Jubilee? We're not going to read throughout all of it. We're almost out of time. But let me tell you what happens. You know, economies being what they are, people find themselves in debt. And perhaps you had to sell your land. Perhaps you had to agree to work for somebody. You had to be their servant in order to pay that debt. But what God said is, after these Sabbaths are completed, and the end of the Sabbath, if you will, like it says in Matthew 28, what happens is the debt is paid, and the, those that were put in bondage are set free. Now, I talk about a perfect picture of what God does for us. You know, the Bible says back in Matthew 28, in the end of the Sabbath, the women went to the tomb right about dawn. Well, that's not chronological. The end of the Sabbath would be maybe between 3 p.m. and 6 p.m. on Saturday. Chronologically, if you're looking at the time, it would be approximately that time on a Saturday evening. That's when, it that's when Sabbath is closing down. But when the women went to the tomb, we're almost halfway into the first day of the week. That's not the end of the Sabbath chronologically, but it's the end of the Sabbath doctrinally. You know, and that you see a perfect picture of that when you look at these seven sevens of years followed by this year of Jubilee. You know, I had a debt that I couldn't pay, and I was in bondage to sin. But at the end of the Sabbath, after Jesus died for my sins, was buried and rose again, and I put my faith and trust in him, my debt was paid, and my bondage was ended. I was set free. And so you see how this Sabbath, it wasn't because, God didn't give man Sabbath because God needed rest. God set this whole thing up to point to and magnify and give honor to the Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus Christ, who ended that Sabbath 
when he rose again from the dead. Nine out of ten commandments we're told we're supposed to follow in the New Testament. There's one that's missing. Nowhere in the Bible in the New Testament does it tell us that we're supposed to keep the Sabbath, keep it holy. I mean, just think about it. The Lord dwells within you. Only one day out of seven is supposed to be sanctified. Only one day out of seven is supposed to be holy. Only one day out of seven is supposed to be the Lord's day. Now, not anymore. Every day. Every day is to be sanctified. Every day is to be the Lord's day. Every day is to be holy. So thank God for how he set things up, and he made it so he, he just puts it together just so precisely that if you just look at it, you just trust what you can learn and pick up and build on, that God can just show you so many things as we study his word. He, he, he'll set things straight for you, and it always ends up magnifying the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God for that. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for what the Sabbath means to us. Lord, we were never under that covenant where we had to do what the Jews had to do. But boy, Lord, as we look back at it and we study it, and, and we just are amazed by how you do things, and it's such a blessing to see how it points to the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, the blessings of the Sabbath don't just, didn't just come to the Jews, Lord, but when the, the end of the Sabbath came because our Savior rose from the dead, we get in on those blessings as well. And we sure do thank you that our debt's paid. We thank you that we're no longer in bondage, but we've been set free. Lord, if there's anyone here today, Lord, they haven't trusted you as Savior. They still owe a debt and they're still in bondage. And Lord, pray, pray that, if we, that as we have lifted up the Lord Jesus Christ and explain what he did for us on the cross when he took our sins and paid for them, and how he rose again victoriously over the grave and over death and over hell, Lord, that they might want, they might want to take part in that victory and have their debt paid and be set free as well. We thank you for being so good to us, and we thank you for this time this morning, and we praise you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Great lesson. Great lesson. That's a blessing. Praise the Lord. You know, in um, Daniel chapter 9, there are uh, the, the prophecy is given there of the times of the Gentiles. The times of the Gentiles are 490 years. That's that same cycle of years. And the second coming of Jesus Christ, that thousand year millennial kingdom, that will be the earth's Sabbath. It'll be a jubilee year that lasts a thousand years. And the book of Hebrews says there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. And so whoever wrote that Bible uh, had the whole thing laid out before he began to give out the pieces to the people that would record it. Amen. All right, we'll be saying much about this in the, uh, in the days, weeks to come. Uh, we have two really, really, really busy seasons of evangelism one is our holiday parades 12 parades first two weeks in december uh, and the other is coming up upon us we've got uh, vacation bible school in just about two weeks and then right after vacation bible school are all the big fireworks events uh, surrounding the fourth of july we're going to work two uh, large events on the third uh, three large events on the fourth and then of course the race in daytona will be on the sixth those sign-up sheets are on the bulletin board in the lobby. Uh, we really need all the help we can get. Uh, they're, they're estimating uh, Crane's Roost over 100,000, Sanford close to 100,000, DeLand will have, uh, they're saying throughout the course of the event, 50,000 people there, race in Daytona over 100,000 people. Uh, you, you say, well, you know, nobody, nobody take the gospel. You can't go into a crowd of 100,000 people and some of them not take a gospel track. Some of them not engage you in conversation. So just out of sheer volume, this is a great uh, time of the year to get the word out. So please, between uh, Sunday School and Church, we'll, uh, please uh, help us by signing up, and we'll, uh, we'll be just continuing to encourage you to do that in the, uh, in the days to come. So, all right, we'll meet back in at 1030, 1030.